So now that we have fitted the data, the next question is how accurate it is. If we take the assumptions that we made about the noise being normally distributed and uncorrelated, we can derive an estimate of the standard deviation of the noise and it's given by sigma hat sigma hat square is E transpose E over NY minus N beta, where NY is the number of uh, data points and N beta is the number of coefficients. So it's essentially an adjusted RMS error. And this is a standard measure of accuracy. Sigma hat will give you an estimate of how much future measurements are going to be different from the surrogate. Uh, people in the social sciences use a different measure which is the coefficient of multiple determination. The square of that coefficient is a measure of how much of the variability in the data is captured by the approximation. So if they take variables like income and age and try to f fit voting prep preferences based on that, uh, if <coughs> they measure uh, a coefficient of uh, R square equal to 0.6, it means that 60% of the variability in voting is captured by the surrogate that depend on age and income. And the formulas uh, basically measure the sum of the square of deviation from the average measurement y hat. So SSY is the sum of the square of the, of the measurement from the average and SSR is the sum of the deviation of the surrogate. And there is also an adjusted coefficient of multiple determination which essentially compensates for the fact that uh, if you have a small number of data points you will tend to fit them very well and get um, an over-optimistic opti notion of how good your um, approximation is. So if we take a second look at the curve fit that we did last time, we see that uh, the surrogate varies between 1 and 30 and the noise that we filter out is only of the order of one. So we are capturing more than 99% um, of the variability and we can expect that R square for this problem will be of the order of 0.99. If on the other hand we generate similar noise again with rand n but now we add it to the function y is equal to 0.1 times x, then it looks horrible. And uh, here we see again the fit with polyfit of the blue curve and the true function, which is the red curve. And we can get uh, the statistics for that uh, by using the MATLAB function regress and the stat or the statistics uh, include several numbers. The first one, point three zero one six, is indeed the R square, and uh, the last one, one point seven four nine eight, is an estimate of sigma hat square. So, in this case, we are capturing only about thirty percent of the variability in the data. Uh, and sigma hat, uh, we generated it from a standard deviation of 1 and here it's estimating it to be the square root of 1.75 or about 1.33, so that's not a bad estimate. Sometimes we are interested not only in the error in the fit, but also the error in the coefficients. Uh, maybe these coefficients are physical constant, like if we fit stress-strain data 
we may get from it as a coefficient the young modulus. Uh, also, the coefficient that are poorly estimated may indicate that the terms that they multiply don't really belong at the surrogate. So, some coefficients are more accurate than others, and you can derive from the assumption that the estimate of the standard deviation in the coefficient is given by sigma hat times the square root of the diagonal term in the inverse of the matrix x transpose x. And you hope that all the um, coefficients that uh, you have are at least twice as large as their errors. Coefficients that are poorly estimated, you may want to drop them to improve the accuracy of the predictions. Uh, unfortunately, when you drop one coefficient, you change the t statistics for all the others. So, if you want to engage in the process of selecting which terms to include and which terms not to include, you may need to iterate on them. I like to be able to do fittings and error analysis in Excel also, not only in MATLAB, because it's more widely available and it's more user-friendly. So, here is an example. You need the add-in data analysis to be able to do that. I first generated the, the noise with the RAND function, which has noise between 0 and 1, subtract 0.5, to get the average to be 0, add it to the function y equal to x, do the fit, and calculate the errors, and you see that, for example, for x equal to 1, the error is 0 0.035, while the noise was about 10 times bigger at 0.26. The file containing the regression output is available by clicking on the schedule box. Here I'm just going to give you the highlights. In particular, we see that uh, the R square is 0.999. This is due to the fact that the uniform error between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5 is much smaller than the normal error that we had before, and indeed it has a standard deviation which is close to that standard error estimate of 0.31 that we see here. We also get uh, the coefficient. The intercept is uh, 0.04, but uh, its standard error is three times larger, so that the t statistic is 0.34. On the other hand, the slope is 0.996, and the t statistic is 150, indicating that the error is very small. Uh, the lower and upper 95 percentile are basically two standard deviations away from the mean, and so the um, intercept can vary between minus 0.2 and plus 0.28, uh, and the, on the other hand, the slope between 0.98 and 1.0. Uh, we also have something called p-value, uh, which tells us what's the probability that uh, the coefficient should be there, that uh, it, what we are getting is just noise, and for the intercept, it's telling us that there is about 74% chance that uh, the true function doesn't have any as for the MATLAB example, I repeated with Excel the same noise with y equal to 0.1x. It's a smaller, uniformly distributed noise, so R-square dropped only from um, 
1 to 0.94. Uh, the standard error should have been the same, but the estimate is now a bit poorer at uh, 0.25. And there is much more uncertainty in the coefficients. If you look at the um, 95 bounds of the intercept, they now vary from minus 0.38 to 0, and for the slope, from 0.099 to 1.2. So we have uh, less confidence because of the fact that the function has a low slope, so the function values are of the same order. So now we'll take an example from the lecture notes that illustrate the use of these statistics to decide between two models. So we have now only five data points. The, five, the function is still y equal to x, but we have a, a lot of So here is the linear fit. The numbers that I would like you to note for comparing with the quadratic fit is that uh, the adjusted R square is 0.917. The standard error is 0.43. The slope is estimated as 0.925, and its t statistics is uh, 6.7. So now we see the quadratic fit. The first thing that we notice is the t statistics of the intercept and the x square variable, that's the last row, are horrible, minus point. 299 and 0 .3899, and the message is uh, you don't need them. We also pay the price. The standard error deteriorated from about 0 0.4 to 0.5, and the t statistic of the um, x uh, deteriorated from about 6.7 to 5.7. This is the graphical comparison of the same problem. You look at the data points and the two fits, and you ask yourself, what's the harm in using the quadratic fit? And as long as you are doing only interpolation, it wouldn't make any difference. But think of what would have happened if you needed to extrapolate the results to minus 3 or minus 4. It's clear that uh, the quadratic fit would give you very large errors. So this is the reason that we like to suppress terms that have a poor t statistics. All the statistical information that um, I showed you depends on the model assumption, and therefore uh, they are vulnerable. Uh, for example, for polynomial response surfaces, all these assumptions are early satisfies. And so we have also an error estimate that doesn't depend on assumptions, and it's called cross-validation. Essentially, you take the data, divide it into groups, and you take one group out, fit the rest of the data, and calculate the error in the points that you took out. The simplest um, case of uh, cross-validation is when you leave one point out, that is, each point is its own group, and then this process is called PRESS, prediction error sum of squares. And so what you are doing is you are taking uh, NY minus one points, fit the data, calculate the error of that fit at the missing point, you repeat it for every point, and uh, then you calculate an RMS error, which is called the press RMS. Uh, if you are doing a response surface, there is actually an analytical formula. EPI is equal to EI over 1 minus EII that will give you that error without actually doing the fit. Uh, the only problem is that um, the matrix E tend to be 
ill-conditioned, and if it's too ill-conditioned, that estimate will be off. <laughs> so, you see here the blue question mark. This is something that I'll put on slides to alert you to the type of questions that I can ask on an exam that will require only a small amount of calculation and uh, still you'll be able to demonstrate that you know and understand the material. Here I'm giving you three pairs of stresses and strain and want you to estimate young modulus using the three different error norms and also as a way of exercising cross-validation. We will go over the solution next time, but keep this in mind for future blue question mark.